All right, hello, and welcome back to the Atlanta Sports Guys here on the Chase Thomas Podcast. The whole gang is back together late this afternoon. We've got 99 The Game and 24-7 Sports, Garrett Chapman. Garrett, good evening, sir. How are you? Fantastic, man. Big weekend ahead. Lots going on. Having are fun. you out on the flats doing cover and practice, too? Yeah, so I'll be doing a lot of the Georgia Tech stuff, okay. and they uh, they have their first official visit this weekend, so... What's the, the SPF summer, so that you're rocking? Really are you busy. on SPF 50 when you're out? Like, are you covering? <laughs> like, how are you making sure that there's no sunburn action going on? Uh, yeah, the SPF 50 is pretty pretty invaluable tool. Mm-hmm. It's, it's it it lives in my car. It has like a certain spot yeah. like right there. You can't, you can't get too hot, so you got to have it in like the dashboard and everything. So uh, I even have my neck gator when I'm in the boys, car, gotta, just in gotta, case. Like my fishing yeah. neck gator, if I'm like going for it, like I'll just throw that bad boy on and uh, in my mid lunch walk. If I don't feel like putting on sunscreen and smelling like sunscreen, because I'm an SPF 50 guy. Max, you're kind of fair skinned too. Are you a big uh, SPF 50 guy? I, t- I tan pretty well. Do you? Uh, okay. I'll you be on like the golf does. course this weekend, and that if I don't wear sunscreen, I'll, I'll get a mean farmer's tan. Mm. Uh, and if I don't reapply, I could get iffy. So. <laughs> So I got a kind of a I got a little bit of a tan like right here, just a bit. It's just All right. I was out golf. I golfed three times last weekend. Max, are we gonna give him probably that? a record? Like he just showed more Wait. white. That was not a tan. What was I, I looking at? It's a Garrett tan. All right, I Garrett know tans what Garrett are tan different. Oh, my handicap? I don't. Even, I have no idea. I uh, I've been playing a lot of nine hole courses, and it would have extrapolated if you extrapolate my score. I'd have like an, I think my best would have been like an 85, 84. Okay. Yeah, so I'm not right. awful. I'm not good. What's yeah, yours, Max? I'm like a, a six, seven. Oh. Oh, so you're pretty good. I, you know. I <laughs> yeah. Are you playing it, every weekend now? Go. No, <laughs> like twice a month, maybe. Okay. If I can do more, I would like to, but not really. Yeah. Nice. Well, that guy Let's down there, you heard, uh, on the screen. Here on youtube.com slash chase on podcast is max markovich uh also here max good evening sir how are you doing fantastic can't wait to get back at it i've been scouring scouring twitter today for his clips of the, of the every desmond ritter throw every Bijan robinson route they had i guess they had an open practice today at mm-hmm. um at the bends mm-hmm. doesn't does not seem like garrett was there uh which is unfortunate but I, wish I was i'm fiending for some falcons football already it is too early he's fiending well speaking of the falcons we can start here um i have this question for you guys and i'm interested to see where where you land here because the the early returns on the roster um across the board a lot of folks don't like this falcons roster right now um that a lot of upgrades a lot of signings but we'll get into a particular uh espn nfl writer who had a really interesting piece on uh, where the Falcons are at, and especially the defensive signings and the Mike Hughes, Jeff Akutas, uh, Anyamadas, guys like that, Lorenzo Carter, just different different guys that we'll get into. But I'm curious, we kind of know where the strengths are. Maybe we can do that next week. But um, Garrett, when you look at the Falcons' current roster and rotation that they're looking at here going into 2023, what do you think is the biggest positional weakness on this team right now? Where do you think the position is? I, I guess you could probably say linebacker, um, mm. but I'm also expecting a pretty seismic leap from Troy Anderson in year two. Mm. Um, I, I think the Falcons are too. Uh, that just and, and you can see that it, just by evidence of a lot of their decisions that they made over the off season, um, they didn't go resign like a Rashawn Evans or, or go get a, big player or something like that. Somebody, somebody can go in and be a cleanup guy, but I think he's on the roster and that's Troy Anderson. I think he's going to have a big year this year. So it's, it's more just lack of production and expectations and hopes more so than proven. They, they haven't just guys haven't proven it on the field. Like Arnold and is like another one of those guys. I, they're expecting him to be like a 10 sack guy, but we haven't seen it. So we can't really expect it yet. Um, even though I definitely am um so it's just it's just experience i mean like once they we, they get like a lot of these younger guys up and running i think they're gonna be a better football team but um i think they've done a pretty good job at addressing a lot of their needs it's just that they've got a lot of positionless football players especially on offense and i it's hard to really look and point out one specific room like on offense specifically where 
your week because all of these guys can play every position on the field. It seems like that's interesting. I was not expecting you to go linebacker. I wasn't expecting that. Max, me do neither. you go linebacker as well, or where do you go? To me, it's clearly edge. I guess that kind mm. of folds into linebacker. Mm-hmm. Um, there were two that came to mind. Edge is the first um, because I think it's the most pressing. I agree with you about Evie Ketty mm-hmm. and to a lesser extent, D'Angelo Malone. Um, but I, I forget who it was, but I saw someone sort of like rank out all of the uh, edge rooms in on Twitter, like rank out all the edge rooms in the NFL. And when you really compare what the Falcons have in that room, even, you know, even with some projection, it's a bottom third NFL edge room pretty comfortably um I I don't know that I'm not worried about it I I mean worried is a word like they've had the worst pass rush in the league for how long now (laughs) like anything is going to be an improvement and I think they're going to generate a lot more pass rush from the interior Mm -hmm. which will open up possibilities for the edge guys but we're going on (laughs) since John Abraham left that you're looking for a dominant edge guy right and and if it'll come at some point, but I don't think they're on the roster right now. The other one that came to mind, and I've been thinking about this a little more, and I think it's a much less pressing need, but the receiver room is not, is not great. Yeah. Um, it, I, I fully expect Drake London to be a number one wide receiver in the NFL probably as soon as this year. After that, you're looking at, you're looking at a lot of sort of like Matt Collins, um, Scotty Miller, and I understand the reason I say it's a much less pressing need is like, I understand that the counter to that is Kyle Pitts is going to split out wide a ton. Uh, Cordero Patterson is going to have reps everywhere on the field. Bijan Robinson will have reps in the slot like receiver. Johnny Smith, they brought him in he'll do all sorts of things. Receiver is a less important position in this offense than it is for a lot of offenses in the NFL. So I'm not as worried about it. But what made me think of that is like, if Drake London got hurt, um, yeah, you know, God forbid. Like, what is that room? What does that room become? Um, and and I think that that is, those are the two I I sort of flock to. Um, because I think you're right. I, they they plugged a lot of holes this off season. They, you know, they really added a ton of bodies, especially on defense, where you would have said these are the the clear weaknesses. But they had the one of the worst rosters in the league last year, yeah. and I think that that's important to admit. Like, even where they made significant improvements. That it could be a below average unit in the league and still have improved. Um, yeah, I don't know. Chase, what do you think? I'm surprised neither of y'all said corner because I think the corner room still stinks. And this is something that like AJ Terrell masks a lot of this <clears throat> and it kind of builds off what they did this offseason, right? Where to y'all's point about linebackers and edge. I'm not as worried about linebacker just because I think it's the least important position on defense. Generally speaking, you're going to only go two guys and it's just, I don't know. We're mostly primarily in the nickel uh, just era of the NFL where it's just, you're going to have more, more uh, secondary guys than linebackers. It's just usually how it's going to work on the field. Yeah. I would just look at kind of building off the issues with the pass rush. If the pass rush is bad again and Clayus Campbell doesn't make a big jump or it doesn't just keep his same production that he's had over almost 20 years in the NFL. If Bud Dupree doesn't have anything left in the tank, if Lorenzo Carter um, really gives you nothing on the outside, you could see how this gets ugly in a hurry. I mean, you need take one Graham to take the next step. Um, that's a big one. And he showed flash- flashes last year. But this secondary, specifically corner, I would feel a lot more comfortable with the gambles on the Mike Hughes and Jeff Akuda's if there was a strong pass rush. If you had guys that I was pretty certain would get home, that they would be uh, a team that got up to the quarterback at an elite rate where it's like, yeah, I don't trust a lot of these guys in the back end, but they won't be asked to do as much. I think these guys are going to be asked to do a lot. AJ Terrell has been on an island and covers up a lot of weaknesses, but you're gambling on Jeff Akuda figuring it out who has only been bad in the NFL you're gambling on um I mean guys like Trey Flowers working out here you Mike Hughes who again has really only been bad in the NFL so you have two really just guys who come into starting spots in the secondary who have only been bad and that's not to say they will not be bad but when you're thinking at the offseason of like the hit rate for these kind of signings it's pretty low 
generally speaking. And if you get one or two to hit, then great. Then it worked out. You replaced Casey Hayward, this, that, and the other. I just look at this where I'm like, this is pretty weak. And having to bring back Cornell Armstrong because you need bodies at corner, and he was just atrocious last year. Look, I love Jesse Bates and Richie Grant. I think they're going to be great in, at the safety spots. I just think corner is more valuable uh, in this league. And I think the Falcons have really put a lot of faith in these one year gamble on these high upside younger corners who've never really shown it at the NFL level. So in a passing league with a team that is going to struggle to get home and cause problems for uh, elite quarterbacks on their schedule, I just could see a scenario where this secondary gets torched more often than not. So that scares me. I, I, I get that argument um, for sure. I think in sort of thinking about this through my, in, in my head, Falcons probably had one of the two or three worst defensive rosters in the league last year. Yeah. I think that's pretty much indisputable. You pick your spots where you can upgrade um, and, and, you know, you pick a lot of spots, but you can't mm. suddenly make every unit above average. Yeah. I think the corner room is probably a bel- below average in the NFL room. Um, but I, 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 to me, it like comes down to the big gamble in that room is a CUDA. I don't think between, um, between Hughes and Clark Phillips and Darren Hall, like they're going to get serviceable reps uh, from nickel. Mm. The gamble is like Akuda needs to become an average uh, best case scenario, above average outside corner. And I think that's what they're really banking on in that corner room. But the, the safety room to me, and the interior of the defensive line are like now two legitimately above average units in the mm. NFL. Um, I think Richie Grant and Jesse Bates is an above average NFL safety tandem. I think between um, Grady Jarrett, David Onyemata, Clay's Campbell, Taquan Graham, if Eddie Goldman exists, that's a, that's like a legitimately deep and good interior, the likes of which we haven't seen in a while. And so th- you can only do so many things. Uh, I don't think there were very many good edges available this offseason at all. Um, so I don't really fault anything they did there. The thing with corners, is like they could have taken one at eight, right? Mm. I mean, if you're playing for need, th- th- that's a bigger need than running back in a million years. They didn't. They took Bijan and said, we have to sort of have this conversation. And that's. Do your Christian Gonzalez piece. I need a soundbite for this part. Do no, your Christian I'm, Gonzalez I'm not piece. Even, like, I mean, I'm so excited to watch this offense that mm-hmm. like. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not even mad about betting on Akuda for a throwaway pick versus like the excitement we're going to see offensively. But when you're talking about value, like when you're talking about the Bijan pick in the context of value, this is the kind of thing you're talking about. Um, that corner room is a question mark. I think there's a world in which it becomes like a, a really solid unit. Um, I think there's also a world where, you know, if you're talking injuries too, like if AJ Terrell went down, you're in a world of, of hurt. And that's where the depth isn't there yet. I mean, if yeah, AJ this- Terrell goes down, I <laughs> teams may never run on the Falcons again. Like they're just the only passing. Like you're going forty. Like, I mean, when we're yeah. talking about the most important players on the entire team this year, like he might be number one. That's a good point. Like guys, you could least afford to lose. He might be yeah. the number one. Do you him or like Jake Matthews? Yeah, Jake Matthews would be a terrible loss. Just because you don't really have much of a swing tackle at that point. But no, I think the one thing that they have, we don't have a killer necessarily mm-hmm. on defense. I'll say that, like maybe Grady Jarrett, as far as like additions go, I should say. Uh, but like Arthur Smith said in like, I was like, he was on some podcast. I think it was like the green light podcast with Chris Long. Mm-hmm. He said effectively the one thing that they have this year that they haven't had in any past year, at least since he's been here is death. Um, like TQ. I love TQ. Take one Graham. He's not a starting defensive tackle or defensive end. It's it's just it shouldn't be a role that he's in. But that was a role that he was thrust into for multiple weeks out of the year. Um, but if he's coming off of the bench, I think that's a splendid role for him where he continues to develop. And Eddie Goldman, like you mentioned, he's another one of those guys. I mean, I think this defense has a chance to be an above average group. Uh, I think a lot of that also has to do with a new defensive coordinator coming in. What is Ryan Nielsen going to look like? Like, what is his defense going to look like under Ryan Nielsen? Cause we're losing a very good defensive coordinator in Dean Pease. I mean, for all of the lumps that he took with, with critics or whatever, he was a really good DC and he was a good play caller and he was able to adjust his defenses very effectively. Um, especially considering the amount of talent that he had. Uh, Nielsen of course is a new guy and we'll see what happens. He's the first time like sole 
play caller. He was a co-defensive coordinator over there in New Orleans. So I think that's a decent question mark to think about looking ahead to this season. But as far as corner goes, I think Clark Phillips too is going to be a stud. I think he's the steal of the draft, at least for the Falcons. And Hmm. I'm really excited to see what he can do. I mean, if he's, if he's an inch or two taller, he's a first round pick. Like he could be going in the top 15, Uh, but he's not. And he'll be perfect in the nickel. and, And if they're in a pinch, I think they could stick him out wide. Dude was a Jim Thorpe finalist, and he was a stud at Utah. He was really good. And I, I'm really excited to see what he can do for that room, especially if he's thrust into duty, which I expect he will at some point. Just because, like you said, like this this unit is thin, but mm-hmm. it's part of the it's part of this team just not drafting well over the last five years or so, six years. Um, it's what happens when you draft a group in 2017 and not a single one of those guys makes it to like what year four. It's embarrassing. So like this team was just gutted for talent. And it's something that you feel for multiple years down the road. And it's not something that's going to be fixed in one off season, but I will say Terry Fonda did a fantastic job of finding bridge guys and continuing to, to find guys who fit the culture and, and everything else. According to all these quotes that are coming out from the team, he's done that. And I think that Arthur Smith has got his dudes. And I, I mean, it did you weren't Rome wasn't built in a day, you know? So it, it wasn't going to be fixed overnight, but I think that this could be maybe in like that low twenties, low, like, like early, like the, the low twenties, uh, high teens, maybe mm. as far as production goes, because on the flip side, you have a really, really potent rushing attack and they're going to hold the ball for long periods of time. And that's the best friend of a, of a defense is a good offense that holds the football. And that's what the Falcons will do better than damn near anybody in the NFL next year. If, the, if they're in the mid to high teens as a defense, you can start printing playoff tickets. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's I mean, you know, if they're again, that's, high mid, end, though. that's really, really right. High if they're end. a mid 20s defense, a low, a low 20s defense, like I think that's what's going to hold them back. But like, I pretty much have no it's going to be an above average offense. I feel yeah. confident in saying that even if Desmond Ritter is average, I think they're going to be an above average offense. And so it comes down to that it comes down to not not having key injuries. Uh, it comes down to like, what is Ryan Nielsen as a coordinator? Um and how do these additions kind of kind of work out? But I mean, we're talking about corner and edge. Like those are two of the the premium positions in the NFL. Yeah. Um, and and if you're asking me what my main worry about this roster is, it's right there. Can I put on my conspiracy theory hat? Go for it. It's your favorite thing, man. It, it's one of my favorite things. Um, I was listening to Jeff Schwartz on Barnwell's podcast this week. And he said that, and he's maintained this, that Kyler Murray's already played his last down for the Cardinals, that the Cardinals are going all in on being the worst team in football, eating the DeAndre money. Like they are completely blowing this thing up. He's not going to play football again for the Cardinals. The Falcons he talked about where it was like Barnwell wrote in the piece that we can talk about. It's a little curious that they didn't bring in any competition. Shots fired at Taylor Heineke, local legend, (laughs) Collins Hill legend. But it was a little weird. It's like, okay, you're really like, this is, you, there's no real competition here. Like this is Desmond's job. This is uh, his opportunity. We're going to put our team through, like we're going to run the piss out of the ball. So we're not worried about that right now. I think he could have that mindset and want to see what Des is, but I am going to hold out the belief and I'm just sticking to this on June 2nd, Kyler Murray is an Atlanta Falcon before the 2024 season, I think, or t- the calendar turns to 2024. I don't think it's this, a big I difference. Think, huh? So you're saying before it, before 2024, the year, not I think it's next the Falcons are working towards if they are playing 500 football at when Kyler's healthy and the Cardinals are like, all right, like Kyler's you're not, not coming back. back mid season. No, you're not. And also, but not a guy it's like, not like what? he's playing midseason. What about Here's the difference? What about what about Kyler Murray possibly makes you think he'd be an Arthur Smith guy? I don't like, see any of that. He'd be smaller than basically everyone on the <clears> offense <throat> for one. Uh, second of all, like he seems like a bit of a malcontent, uh, and that those are kind of the two things that Arthur Smith's like. No, nah, my my quarterback's gonna have size, and he's gonna be a team first guy. Carson and Palmer I, was traded midseason to the. I, I mean, I think I think if it's a midseason trade, it's Ryan Tannehill. Like I, I don't. Think so, I, I think that's. I think it's Kyler. And what you've what I've learned from Terry Fontenot is that man is going to go BPA 
and he's going to look at it as just like the well, Bijan, it's... the Kyler, and we're just going to put as many dudes where it's like, can you imagine defending some of the open space stuff with Bijan and Kyler? Kyler, why didn't the they go for Lamar? If that's like, I mean, like, that's I think it was contract money. Like, Kyler's already locked Kyler's in, already and Kyler contract. wasn't healthy. I, I'm, I'm like, he's not, not playing for the second half of the year. It's not going to happen, but it's fun to discuss. Um, I Mark it down. It, June 2nd, Kyler Murray will be an Atlanta Falcon. He will be the next franchise quarterback. If this happens, then you can clip this, and that'll, mm-hmm. be, that'll be sick for you. Um, <laughs> it ain't happening. I mean, I, I think if, 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 like, this roster was, like, you know, if they were doing really well and Ritter was just awful and Heineke, whatever, it would be Tannehill. Like, he knows the system. He'd slot right in. You can pretty much bank on him being, like, the – 13th best quarterback in the league and i ryan Tannehill could take this team to the playoffs tomorrow um i think anyone can honestly like i don't think we're understanding that's that's the predicament they want to they want to put to the test right they want to see if desmond ritter the best case right what is the best case for him the 11th best quarterback in the league 10th yeah somewhere around there probably so like 12 12 i I think arthur smith has this like quiet-ish arrogance (laughs) about like Man, it doesn't freaking matter. You know, I can make, I can build an offense around this guy's skill sets, anybody's skill sets, basically, and we're gonna be really darn good because also we have um, a total unicorn at tight end, one of the greatest running back prospects to come out in for the last couple decades, and a really good wide receiver one and a kick-ass offensive line, and that's kind of like I think that's what he believes, and so he's saying. If anyone can do it, um, why don't I pay a third round pick to do it? Who I think is good enough, right for now. And then if something comes along later, we we pounce at that. But I don't think it's like it's the Kyle Shanahan thing where it's like I don't care if it's Jimmy Garoppolo, Brock Purdy, Trey Lance. I can win with anybody. I can get the Super Bowl with anybody. Well, right. And if and if anyone can do it, you know why pay Ryan Tannehill twenty million? Why pay you know Jimmy Garoppolo thirty million when I could pay Desmond Ritter? Honestly, I have no idea what Desmond Ritter makes. A mm. couple million? Know. Yeah, not a lot. Five million would probably. But it also depends on where we, we are in the timeline, or at least in Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith's mind. Like, what what's their expectation this year? God, there's a blessing fly. Um, there's just been this fly that's been hovering around my face this, this entire podcast. It's killing me. Shout out to Breaking but, Bad. An unrelated um, episode. <laughs> but the... Um, <laughs> I lost my train of thought here. No, it just depends on where they expect the team to be right now. Like I don't like, my expectations for this team are like, maybe they're different from what Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot expect. One of the reasons they didn't go for a guy like Lamar Jackson, I think it's because this team wasn't in position to go win. Now that also flies in the face of whatever they did with Deshaun Watson, which honestly just feels like just an anomaly more than anything at this point. But uh, I mean, if, if they feel like Max in your situation where they're, what was it? They're five and five and maybe they're, they have position to, to make a move and Desmond Ritter has been dreadful. Then I think the guy's already on the roster for this season as Taylor Heineke. They're going to go to him and he's going to figure it out. He has experience doing that and dragging a team to the playoffs yep. with mediocre quarterback play. Like I think, I think that's right. I, I also think like you asked where they are. And I think this is a really fascinating question because I, they've basically all but admitted the last two years were like you we need this time to like reset yeah. everything like we we were screwed and now we needed to like unscrew things so that we could start moving forward this year is like we are now moving forward yes but i think if you ask them you gave them truth serum and you said you know in, in your heart of hearts like what is this year? What is next year? What is the year after? Like, I think this is the beginning of moving forward. I think if they, I think they think they can make the playoffs in this division, like no question. I think they think in the next two, three years, they could be a Super Bowl contender. I and I think yeah, the quarterback is part of that, right? You don't want to get the quarterback wrong. And if, and if you don't think like this is the all or nothing year, and I don't think there's any scenario in which either of their job security is on the line this year. I think that they, they have said, we're going to be, we're going to get this right. And in the meantime, we're good enough to go to the playoffs this year and build off of that. I think their job security is on the line. If it's like, I think five and 11 gets you fired or five and 12. I think Arthur Smith can't do that. I think you have to hover. I think the minimum get there. it's seven. I think seven is the minimum. It would be my gut. They're if they fired. win six, if they win six, I don't think they're not, if they win six games, I don't think they're six fired. and 11 is bad. 
I think that's an under I think like that's a bad, bad year, but yeah, I think but there's it's... like a there's a complete understanding of what happened the last two years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No one is under any illusions that anyone has underperformed the last two years. Anyone's done a poor job. Like it's very obvious what happened. So I, I think like first of all, dragging last year's team to seven wins and what was it, seven the year before too? Mm-hmm. Like that's that's pretty darn good coaching for yeah. one. And this is the beginning of the roster rebuild for the GM. So this is year one for all intents and purposes. And I think it would take something pretty dramatic to like cut that off. We also can't discount the fact that the gradient jerseys are gone. And wh- how many wins does that mean? If we get three vintage Falcons uniforms, what does that mean for the season? It, well, it means you can count on three wins and then right? you sort of like build off of that. Right. I'm so excited for that. Like, it's so stupid how hyped I am when I see them, like when they're back out, like I, I just, I'm just, I don't care what, how the game goes. I'm just going to be just in a great mood all day. My wife's going to be like, what is wrong with you? And I'm just like, it's Falcons uh, classic uniforms day. But if you had to guess today, mm-hmm. would do you think the Falcons win this division? Yes. This year? Yeah. I would. The, here's another take. <clears throat> they don't win the division. I would fire Arthur Smith. Whoa. Like no, no questions asked. Whoa. He's out. He's got it. No. So he's, I'd be, this they, division, the bottom would have to fall out this year. And like, they would have to look bad on the football field for him to be fired this year i think if he goes to win seven games i think i'd be i'd be very upset and disappointed and next year we're giving him the ultimatum figure it out this is your season i think that's right if he comes out and he wins nine games and this is the playoffs by a year are you firing him for that yes no Absolutely yeah, you're not. Out. This division of Baker no Mayfield is all offense. Arthur Tampa Blank Bay. has no history of, do, of acting I mean, like that. It, it, yeah, John Gruden is to... installing the New Orleans Saints offense. We've got Bryce Young who can't see over his offensive lineman to start it would be Carolina a, it camp. Would be a black eye for Arthur Smith. But the way that this roster is constructed, it's finally looking yeah. like a team in his image. Great. Kellen Moore and... can come in and coach that roster that's ready to go. Great. <laughs> This is well, bonkers. No, it's, it's, this it's is a, bonkers it is an stuff. offense that is that completely We were just talking about Arthur Kyle. We were talking about Arthur Smith in the same breath as Kyle Shanahan, and yeah. now you're like, eh, Kellen Moore. Yeah, just get a Lafleur. <laughs> There's like 13 of them. Just, no, play, just yes, take him in. Yes, get a Lafleur. We have a Lafleur. Another is Lafleur. Lafleur. There's, they are, they are mirror each other. Lafleur. They were like best friends. They worked together. They, they all worked under Shanahan. Yeah, give it's me another one. Is it a hot take to say he's a better coach than Lafleur? Which one? Are we talking about I the I don't Green, think Bay Packers coach? Green Bay Packers? Green Bay floor. I don't mm-hmm. think we know yet. Yeah. We'll know okay, more this fair. year with Jordan Love. That's fair. Yeah. I mean, he's because he had Aaron Rodgers and had a great yeah. season, and then that Aaron Rodgers and had a not so good season. So it's kind of hard to tell. And then Arthur Smith, I want to see what he can do this. I think this is a huge year for him. This is the first year that I have had legitimate expectations for the Atlanta Falcons since 2018. And well, I think that's the big thing, right? Like you have legitimate expectations. This is an expectation year. When I look at this division, I just, the reason I'm ruling with an iron fist here is I think this division is going to be dog shit. And if he doesn't break through this year, I'm just, that means the way I look at it is like, if the Falcons don't win the division and end the playoff drought and just host their first playoff game in the new bins, that means something went very, very wrong with this offense. A lot of, maybe it's a lot of injuries. Maybe it's just Desmond Ritter sucks. Maybe Jake, like, I, I don't know. Like I, but there's something that has to go cataclysmically wrong for them not to beat Baker Mayfield, Derek fair. Carr, and rookie Bryce fair. Young for this division. I just I don't it, think that's fair. I, I mean, I think that's I think it's something would have to go really, really wrong. He's not wrong there. Like something would have to go really wrong on this team for them not to win. I mean, I like, think they should be expected to win. I, I'm expecting them to win. I think the Panthers are going to be a good team. I think the Saints will be a good team. I think this, the Falcons will be a good team. And like, but it, they, they are absolutely one of the teams that is best positioned to separate themselves. I just believe in them more. I, I don't believe in a rookie quarterback. And then I don't believe in, I just don't believe in the Saints really uh, to finish the, the job under Allen. So, John look, Gruden they, they is out here the installing division. the Saints offense. Like, I have never been more. Sell all your New Orleans Saints stock here. Like, what are we doing? I'm I'd, very have far to, I'd have to own any to sell it. So. Yeah. That's <laughs> like, they're like, just just sell it. Um, Max, Falcon schedule insight. What do you think is the biggest stretch of games for this Falcon season? Where have you circled where you're like, we'll know exactly if this team where this team is based on this stretch? Um, I can tell you when I look it up. Uh, 
I, it, here's the problem with the schedule. Like, it is a really weak schedule. Yeah. Um, mm. And even the potential, like, pitfalls, I guess. Like, they get Bryce Young week one. Like, mm. they get the rookie quarterback in week one. They get Jordan Love week two. Uh, that's great because if either of those guys are going to, you know, you'd expect both of them to improve throughout the year to some extent. Lions, Jags, I'm excited for back to back um, because I think that we can expect both of those teams to be really good. But then you get Texans, Commanders, Bucks, Titans, who should all be pretty god awful. Um, so I'm, you know, I think that a game like the Jags will be a real litmus test. A game like the Lions should be a real litmus test because as the Lions get all this freaking hype, like show me where the Lions are, are that much better than the Falcons. Um, just because they won their offensive line, I would say better. for sure. Their offensive line is, is markedly better. And I'd much rather have Jared Goff this year. Great. Yeah. Uh, they don't have, they don't have, uh, you know, a Kyle Pitts type, I mean, they might uh, be missing double-digit guys from gambling policy <laughs> violations by the time this season. They goes also around. have one receiver, and their offense—they need more than one receiver. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't Jameer think, Gibbs, I don't really think Jameer defense. Gibbs is like a Bijan Robinson equivalent. And their no. defense is also very thin. If you go look at that roster, so like, let's beat the piss out of the Lions, <laughs> run the ball down their throat, and then sort of put put our mark on. Okay, like this is real. Um, and I also think, like, I think we're going to learn things in stages with this team. Mm. Uh, that Panthers week one game will be a real test for Desmond Ritter. Like, that Panthers defense, I don't think the offense is going to be very good yet, but I think that defense can be legit. Um, I think that we're going to learn about the Packers defense, you know, also could be pretty good. We're just going to learn different things. Um, and I think Garrett said it best. Like, I am. I have never. I haven't been this excited for a Falcons season since <sighs> shit. Since pre Super Bowl, probably because like after the Super Bowl, I was just depressed for a few years. <laughs> I'll never forget being in the city for that. Like that, the next morning, I will never forget. It was cloudy. It was just like a nuclear bomb went off in Atlanta. That was one of the craziest, craziest days in Atlanta. I'll I'll never forget it. Like that, and then the Ice Bowl. For Titans Rams is for whatever reason stuck in my brain. I just remember that whole thing. Y'all are pretty young for that one. I don't even know. Like I was, I was five. Yeah, um, I was eight. Too young. Yeah, so you're old enough to know what's going on. Yeah, like I was, yeah. I was memorizing Isaac Bruce stats at that age. So I was, I was in the know. Yeah, I missed class the whole next day. I was in college. <laughs> <Brutal day. laughs> yeah, I, I literally skipped school. I did not go to class, and then I, I had my my professors uh, waved. I had like a, a pop quiz. And mm-hmm. then I had my professor who had the pop quiz. He, he like called me up after class. He was like, don't worry. I waved it for you. Don't worry about that. I, it was a tough day on Sunday. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, it was. You're talking Super Bowl, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I had friends just like pour in Venmos, <laughs> like pity Venmos to my account. Uh, yeah. The next day it was very cold, very icy in Ann Arbor. And I felt like death. Yeah. See, Georgia Southern, it's like everyone's a fa- most everyone's a Falcons fan already. Mm-hmm. And so it was just sort of like a really... Uh, sad day. Why do we get on this topic? Why, why are we talking? <laughs> I don't about know. This? Garrett, I don't know. It's, Garrett, it's, it's what, part of our DNA as Falcons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It what, really is. What's, what's your pivot point for the Falcons season? Where are you going to like? Week. I'm hmm. looking at the bye week specifically because of where it stands. It's week 11. I love that. I love the way it sets up because you have a a winnable stra- like, like a stretch right after that. You have the Saints at home. Then you travel to New York. You got Tampa Bay at home at Carolina Colts at the bears in a cold icy game where there's going to be a lot of running. Um, which I mean, by that point, I think the Falcons will know exactly who they are on, on offense and playing that with, well, I'd it's hope gonna, so by week. It's going to be a sick cold right. weather team. That's going to be a good cold weather team, but then they go, they finish the season against New Orleans. Like that is, that is a make or break stretch right there. I think this mm-hmm. team, the early part, I know Max, you talked about it. You, it'll set the tone for the season and we'll know who they are by that bye week but after that i think that's where they're gonna that's where we're gonna figure out what kind of team because the last two years they really folded down the stretch um last year especially they really kind of wilted but i think that just had a lot to do with their depth uh they didn't have anybody and so they were basically playing practice squad guys or guys who should be on a practice squad uh, as their depth players or starters in some cases um 
And I, I think if they can really, really establish the run down the stretch, they have the chance, especially looking at these teams, to punish some of them. And I think if they can pull out wins, like against New- the New York Jets, I think they can pull out a win against that team if they can punish them enough on offense. Uh, I think it's going to be a good game. But look, if they can finish the stretch strong and finish it maybe like four one, maybe four wins or something, I think this is a playoff team. This is as weak a schedule as I've seen. It's a bad schedule. In a like long time. But I'm okay with that. The Falcons need it. That's why another thing, like when you look at the schedule, this just looks like 10 wins at the worst to me. When I look at I this, see 10 wins. this is why I'm terrified because I don't know if you guys are in the same way, but like me at the bar every week uh, watching these Falcons games in my work done jersey and being the only Falcons fan here in Knoxville. It's a sad state of affairs most weeks, but I don't fe- I haven't felt anything for the last two years because they're not playing for anything where it's like this is just it's a fun way to spend three hours like, yeah, the Chargers game ripped my soul. Uh, but outside of that game, like there, I mean, the Bills game, too. I was pretty, pretty PO'd at the Bills game two years ago. That was I still Matt Ryan, the dirty. Head. Anyway, anyway um, you haven't had a reason to like fully emotionally invest yourself again. And they've been kind of on the outskirts while the the Hawks and the Braves have gotten our full emotional investment um, based on what they've been doing week over week. I'm excited and terrified to m- bring them back into my life as a not that I haven't been watching it, just that like, oh, I have expectations again. Like you should be hosting a playoff game. You should be winning that you should be dominating some teams. Now we should start to look like an actual NFC contender like flashes of it i'm not saying you're the favorite but we should be seeing flashes of like how that how they finally get there next year or the year after where it's like all right it's completed they're now a juggernaut and they should be realistic nfc super bowl contenders for the next couple of years like that is where i'm at and that's just kind of terrifying because we haven't been there in a while it's nerve i would mm-hmm. i would say that i have been good at inventing reasons to be emotionally invested the last few go. years uh and this year i don't have to invent anything yeah and that's um um if they played next sunday i'd be ready uh and it is june 2nd so we gotta pace ourselves It'll be a long summer i mean it's gonna be a lot of winning this year tennessee uh joe milton michigan heisman back-to-back yeah. big 10 champions coming back with jj mccarthy yeah i agree yeah there's an outside chance that this season starts off really poorly though <laughs> i don't do that. like i can it. see it i can see it like I'm optimistic, trust me. I mean, I, I said that this team is going to be ten wins, but like Vegas I mean, is rarely wrong, like really wrong. Mm-hmm. They have us at eight and a half. And the funny thing is, I had a buddy, so my co-host, he he goes, he went on some BetQL thing or whatever, and they asked him like, "Yes, yeah, so the line for the Atlanta Falcons eight and a half, easy under, right?" That's the national narrative, and I mean, maybe they see something we don't, and maybe we have our are uh, red and black glasses on. But it's like, you look at this start, these are four teams that could be in the playoffs. Mm. So if you think about it that way, like those are four really good teams, potentially. We and should also say like... Were, the Jags were a couple plays away from like potentially playing in an AFC championship game last year. Um, like this could be a good, this could be a good group. And then the Texans are terrible. But I mean... <sighs> I was talking now, Bryce Young and Jordan Love, like past Falcon secondaries would get shredded by those guys week mm. one and two. It'd be like, oh my God, this year's going to be so much worse than I yeah. thought. And then suddenly you've got a Lions offense that's going to be really good and a Jags offense that's going to be really good. And Calvin Ridley goes for 150 yards and you want to die. And like, totally, I could see that. I, I forgot about not that. Like, Calvin Ridley is going to be I, his Players Tribune article. I'm all in on Calvin Ridley. Totally. Like, I'm I really, just think really a two guy. and two record. I would take a two and two record. Yeah, I think that's look fine. At, you one look at three. the rest of the schedule. Like, if you go two and two and you don't win ten games, like that'd be pretty hard. But one and three. No, I'm not taking one and three. This team's gonna be good. Yeah. Okay. I, I, no, no, no. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Where do we draw the line? So it's like one and a half wins. One and I don't, three. I think I'm... you're gonna be you're gonna be an underdog to the to the Lions in Detroit. I think that's going to happen. And you're gonna be an underdog to the Jags in is that in London. I think it's in London. Yeah, it's in London. To you're gonna be an underdog to the Jags in London. Um, no matter what happens the first two weeks, both of those that Packers game is going to be a pick I just know it. Where is, is it in Atlanta? Yeah. I think, I think we'll, well, I don't know. Maybe don't know. a point we'll favorite or something. Point, point and a half. 
yeah, we'll see. I think this, I mean, it's going to be a very busy off season. I think this team is a lot better than the national media gives it credit for, but I think it all comes down to if Desmond Ritter's above average, this defense, this team is going to be really good. And and I also think like not to belabor so much Falcons talk on a <laughs> second, but the pre like maybe I'm getting unnecessarily hyped for preseason. I, I think that that's going to be really important for Ritter. Hmm. Um, like he didn't get that many reps. He got no in-game reps with Kyle Pitts last year, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's, you know, got a few reps with, with Drake London um, and the offensive line. He got four games, B. John Robinson introduction, like all of those things. Like, I think those will be important reps for him as he sort of like builds on the confidence that he's been talking about mm-hmm. so that he's ready to go because those first two games are really important uh, mm-hmm. that you might be fit. You probably will be favored in and yeah, man. Well, we'll see what happens. Either way, this is it's nice to be optimistic about the Falcons again and have expectations. Uh, this might be a different take here. Um, I want to do a should, or he, should he stay or should he go series. And we're going to start with the, uh, in terms of the Atlanta Hawks and some of the big names here each week. I think this could be a fun offseason idea. Because I'm like swatting Clint Capella trade rumors like flies over here where a friend of the pod, Lauren Gunn, asked like what the value is for Hawks, tw- like Haw- asking Hawks Twitter, like what's Clint Capella's trade value? And I was like, well, um, it's the blessing of Trey Young. So very high. And because I Trey Young has not looked at Clint Capella when finishing an alley oop in two and a half years. So the man, there's not anyone in the, on this team that has more in uh encore chemistry than Clint Capella and Trey Young. So I'm just I have my doubts that as long as Trey's here, that Capella is moving on. That all being said, speaking of Trey Young, I think he we have to start here. Garrett. First question here involving Trey and should he stay or should he go this offseason? What do you think his trade value is around the league? Because the thing, the Lakers thing came up and we were all like, no, I don't. The Lakers have nothing to offer. Like, unless it's Anthony Davis, it's just you hang up the phone because there's just no reason to even engage. That being said, if you told me anything in terms of what Trey Young's trade value is at the moment, I would probably believe you because I have no earthly idea what it would look like right now around the league and with smart teams and how they value him what what do you think his trade value is at the moment uh i'm just gonna say this i think he's untradeable right now just hmm. because the, the hawks probably have a value for him and it's probably it's likely something that no team is willing to pay right now is he worth worthy of that maybe maybe not but that's not the point the point is You've built and leveraged so much in Trey Young right now. It's he's not going anywhere. Like it would, it would take somebody being like throwing like some desperation heave at him, where they're like, "Yeah, this is the year we got to do this." Like LeBron James comes back and maybe LA does it, or which I don't expect that to happen. Um, but they don't have the assets to make it really entertain the idea because mm. uh, they're not giving up Anthony Davis. Like that's not something that they're going to send over because they would want to win a championship next year. And if they're not, if Anthony Davis isn't there, then that hurts those chances, obviously. So it would, it would just, it's not happening really. I, I just don't see, I'd give it like a 99.5% chance of him being on the Atlanta Hawks next year. Like it's just, it's just because, I mean, what do you, you're not going to offer him like five first round picks or something. Three first round picks probably won't be enough to get it done. You know, I don't know. What do you think, Max? It's not happening. That's all. I don't know. Yeah, I I, I completely agree. It's not happening. I have strong, strong reason to believe the Lakers have no interest, and I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) That's not. Also, if they had interest, like I don't know. There's no deal there. Um, I just don't. I don't see the urgency with it, and I don't think Quinn Snyder sees the urgency with it. Um. Because I, I do think to like entertain this whole que- hypothetical question of like what's his value around the league, like that is fascinating because mm. I, I do think he re- rehabilitated it a little bit in that Celtic series. A little bit of the Trey Mystique was back. Um, and I think under Quinn, he could have a really nice year that reminds people like, hey, there's so much talk about what he can't do and what he isn't. Like yeah. he, he at his best, he is a, he is a, one of the most dynamic offensive players in the league. Um, whether he's at his best enough and whether he lifts other people around him and whether he will ever play even slightly below average defense, like that's all very much in the air. But 
it's like the Russell Westbrook thing where it got to the point where who called I think it's Zach Lowe or someone who calls it the 90 10 guys where like everyone spends so so much time on the 10 percent that he can't mm. do rather than the 90 percent that he can and I just don't know what that team is right now that's desperate enough that wants that because if you trade for Trey Young you trade mm. for someone who's going to occupy 25 30 percent usage no matter what otherwise what's the point in trading for him yeah. Um, it's not a team like the Blazers who everyone's sort of like they're floating the three pick. Yeah. It's not a team like the like Boston, I don't think, for Jalen Brown, which I think the Hawks would love. I was going to say, would y'all do that? No hesitation. Jalen for Trey? No. Really? I think I would. I would do it. No hesitation. I think I would. But I, I don't know. I don't think I would. I don't think Boston would like he just, I don't think he's, they would not a, yeah. he's not a Boston type of player like and, and that's a team like that is the, the team <clears throat> that, that he would thrive on most right all those guys around him would guard uh he can come in and be the lead guard uh he can defer to Tatum when he should defer to Tatum because Tatum's way better but it, it's hard to player like that you don't just trade a player like that and get full value because it's hard to see him fitting into an already made contender. I also wouldn't be surprised if Phoenix get if Phoenix like if there's one guy around the league who absolutely adores Trey Young and would love to have him in a playoff series, it's Kevin Durant. Like Kevin Durant's definitely the guy around the league who's like Hooper. Like he's like, like uh, it's like the two different types of basketball fans where it's like uh, that boy nice versus uh, <laughs> just the set like on the bus. Like he, I guarantee you, Trey Young is a like a bit like. Kevin Durant is all in on the Trey Young experience. It's funny. Would you do Devin Booker for Trey Young? 100% oh, my in a million God. years. Absolutely. Uh, the, I think Trey Young actually fits a lot better with. It, it's Durant funny. Devin, Devin Booker's Booker a way better player, though. Yeah. It's funny to think that, like, the Trey Young teams are the Kyrie Irving teams. Yeah. Like, honestly, like, Brooklyn, Brooklyn might be the team that if this ever happens, like, that is. They can sort of rebuild around him, throw him in New York. He's a Knicks. Well, we're getting Mikael Bridges back in that trade. <laughs> Done. Yeah. Yes. Sign me up. Uh, that's why. And they have like a million wings. Like that mm. is the the fit that if this were ever were to come to pass, I would hope they're interested because that's the package mm. that intrigues me most. But uh, that's a year from now. It's not now. Yeah. In a perfect world, we we end up with. I don't. I think this team is going to look a lot different next year. And if. if I think they need more wings. I really just at the end of it, like you said, he needs them because they need to hide him a little bit more on defense. I think his effort level improved significantly under, under Quinn Snyder. Um, he's still not going to be like, he still wasn't a below average even defender, but he was less putrid, I guess. Because what about, there. what about Houston for Jalen green? No. I don't I'm think so probably. Either. I'm just gonna say, I, like, they're not gonna trade him. I'd be very surprised if they do it. I, I, Trey I Young and Capella for Gobert and Conley. <sighs> no, what are you on? No, <laughs> I'm not doing it. No, I think I think Quinn Snyder and Trey Young are gonna get a year together. They absolutely are. I think Quinn Snyder wants to see what he can do. He's the best playmaker Quinn Snyder's ever had. So. I mean, he's probably the best, one of the best playmakers in the NBA. Like, just as far as all around offensive game is concerned, and like he was on that. What is this pod? His his podcast or somebody else's podcast? He was doing some podcast thing, and he's talking about how he's like Quinn Snyder and him are, are working on him, just quote jacking up more threes or whatever. Which I don't know how I feel about necessarily, but I would just like uh, more to go in. Got somebody you could That'd be get cool. his shot because if Trey Young can get his shot up to forty percent. I mean, that'd be great. I would just take league average. Uh, 38%. Yeah. Yeah, I'd take that too. Um, I don't know if he'll ever be a 40% guy. That's no, I think do. that ship has sailed. Uh, maybe in his late stage. I could see like 35-year-old Trey Young who comes in off the bench and is only spot up three guy uh, yeah. is averaging. Like, I'm going to be honest. I can't see 35-year-old Trey Young. I can't either. No? Period. Period. Mm, what what is his why. role in the NBA if like he sort of loses? Yeah, whatever. I mean, he's 20 what 23 24, he's uh 22. jared jack um based on what we saw with Dejounte murray last year and trey young when they were on the floor together how did he and Dejounte work did you see enough that lends you to believe trey young and Dejounte is a partnership that is worth exploring for another full year 
for another full year like the full year you just go into this offseason that you're like i think i saw enough based on them on the floor together this past year that we can run it back with those two i think i saw enough out of the team period with Mm -hmm. quinn snyder that i want to see it again um I, the simmering thing here is like DeJounte Murray can't sign an extension. Mm. He's going to go to free agency. Yes. And if he wants to leave, he can leave for nothing. And that's a disaster. Right. Mm. Uh, so I, I don't, there's no sense that he does want to leave. Right. There's been nothing to that effect, but if they got the vibes that he might, you would have to consider trading him because mm. I mean, and that would be a nightmare because you'd get way less than you traded for him, but you can't you can't let it get to free agency and then suddenly learn he doesn't really want to stay here mm-hmm. and he's not gonna sign the extension nor should he. So that's almost a trickier thing than Trey. Like you really have to feel that out. And if if DeJounte was like, I'll resign here, but you gotta trade Trey, then what happens? Does he get an extension this summer? I don't I don't DeJounte, yeah. I don't think he he what the CBA rule is that he can't sign an extension more than X percent over his past deal because this isn't his second deal. Hmm. Right. He signed that. He signed an extension in San Antonio. That's mm-hmm. like whatever he makes now, 18, 16, 18 million, whatever it is. Like and it's the same rule as Jalen Brown. Like if you don't make all NBA, you can't, it's a different rule than Jalen Brown. I don't freaking know. The contracts are complicated. The CBA is wild. Um, Needlessly wild. All I know is that like it's not in DeJounte Murray's interest to sign an extension right no. now because he's going to make more if he goes to free agency. So that's just going to leave the Hawks in a really tricky spot. Man. Uh, Garrett, what did you see Quinn do differently down the stretch here that leads you to be optimistic about how he'll use Trey Young going into next year? Uh, it wasn't necessarily – Anything that I saw Quinn Snyder do, it's the way I saw Trey play under him. Um, like I said, I said it a little minute, I mean, maybe five minutes ago, something like that. It was you saw the increase of effort on defense. You saw the way that his demeanor, even in the, the huddle, all of it changed and elevated. Um, maybe it's just Trey in the honeymoon period. Maybe it's not, but I think Quinn's more of a player coach and he's more forward thinking and innovative than Nate McMillan was. Really, I mean, Nate, I don't know if anyone would ever put him with innovation in the same sentence, but um, I think Quinn Snyder is absolutely on that list of, of one of the better coaches in the NBA. And I think that he and the Trey Young had a, a solid connection. And if they can build on that, then that, I think that's great. Uh, because really, it's like if he has a relationship with Trey Young, it's half the battle, it seems like, because he sometimes lets his emotions get the best of him. I, I will also say, uh, as an aside, it's a really smart move that the Hawks fired Nate when they did and, and worked Absolutely. to hire uh, uh, um, Quinn as soon as possible because if the Hawks' availability was open right now, they would be fifth on the totem pole at best, yeah. fourth. Giving Monty like, Williams a max contract. An obscene <laughs> amount of money, by the way. Dear God. That yeah, could get up to $100 million. Detroit, Detroit's coach. just a coach away, you know? They're just a coach away. Um and it's funny too when people talk about like it's it doesn't matter who cares it's not a part of the CBA and I'm like no 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 that means like he's not gonna spend like that still money he has to spend out of his pocket and that will lend that owner to not mm-hmm. invest more on the encore or it's like I'm still paying this guy. They were the money. worst yeah. team in the <laughs> NBA this year. Like, yeah. why do you think you need to pay a coach 13 million? Yeah. Anyway, but he's known for. I mean, we're we're development, the right? I you can hire a younger and a cheaper development. Yes, guy. there's no like. Love Monty Williams. Shout out to him for getting the bag. Like, it's not a Monty thing. It's just like, it reminds me of Mel Tucker to Michigan State, honestly. Hell yeah. Let's get into that. Right? Like, doesn't it where Mel Tucker kept saying no to Michigan State when he was at Colorado? And they were like, okay, what about now? Monty I, can do an, just, I can do an hour on Mel Tucker in that contract if you want. I mean, it's, you are, it's one of the worst in college football right now. It's hilarious. It's absolutely hilarious. Every dollar is guaranteed only because, like, there was one article that was like, Mel Tucker might get hired at LSU. And they were like, oh my God. Well, I think it was also because D'Antonio left and really late in the process where they were like, oh, they screwed them over. That yes. roster was barren. Yeah. But anyway, still want to be seem happy about it. I'm thrilled. Are you kidding me? <laughs> What's the rivalry called? It's, there's no name. 
I don't. It's not even a rivalry. You don't play late. Like it's not really a lesser <laughs> game. You say it's not a rivalry. Oh, like it's very much right. They hate each other. Any, anytime you say it's not a rivalry, there are like five message board threads <laughs> on the MSU message board that go up. Like, how dare you? I just don't <laughs> think it is. Like Michigan, Ohio State's the rivalry. I don't think Hell it is. Yeah. I would even argue. Michigan Penn State's a bigger rivalry. No, it's not. Um, I'd say Michigan. It's not. It's not. The, well, Michigan... I'm saying in terms of like history and like where they are in resources and like where they are in the tier status in the Big Ten. Maybe on paper, I can tell yeah. you that like those fan bases hate each other more than mm. than Michigan it's, or Ohio, Penn State's State also only been in the Big Ten for what like thirty years. Hmm. Yeah, 40 years. Yeah, I believe you. Also, James Franklin's a a beta. Wow. See, I'm mediocre a Franklin coach. guy. I think he's good. He's a better coach than Mel Tucker, but he's mediocre. Yes. Wow, look at this guy. He goes to two back-to-back playoffs and is just like <sighs> feeling himself in the the Michigan Wolverines. Yeah, like, yeah. Blake Corum coming back. This is, this is the year. This is the year. Last thing, we'll go. <laughs> what would it mean for the direction of the franchise? Like, I think that there's two ways to go to to think about this, and this is something I was thinking about this week. Like, if they were to trade Trey. Would that signal, if they were to go down that road, do you think they would have to do a full reset and that would signal that they're about to tear this whole thing back down and start over with this new administration? Or do you think they would try and trade Trey for equal value and not worry about the picks and stay a playoff team, get that gate revenue? I would be very curious to see which way they go because I think any kind of trade trade or even DeJounte would signal where this franchise plans to go. I, I think that's an underrated part uh, in the trade trade conversation. It's like, I don't actually know which direction they would choose to go. What do y'all think? I, I think one thing we haven't talked about today, Travis Schlank quietly to the Wizards. Oh, yeah. Sliding mm. out the door, the guy who staked his entire tenure on the Trey Young trade, the Trey Young Luca trade, quietly slipped out the door. They're already in a, a, a phase of transition, mm. right? And and so the people in that building aren't the ones who invested it all in Trey. And I have no, I, I have no idea how they feel about Trey. Mm. Um, but I, I would be, I, I don't. They're not going to go full rebuild. I don't think it would be. I mean, they just made that trade for Dejounte Murray, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, they just poured all of those draft picks into Dejounte Murray. Those are coming due several years down the road. Like, there's pretty much no incentive to tank it out. Um, so I think, but I, I think it would be a move to give you more flexibility. I think they would get a younger or not a younger, maybe, but like a young core piece and other assets. And I think that would give you flexibility to move around rather than pay Trey and DeJounte max money and trim costs along around the edges. Um, because frankly, like the more we talk about it, like, I don't know how they're going to afford to pay DeJounte Murray and Trey Young full max deals, keep DeAndre Hunter. They just extended Bogey for some reason. Um, and Leave playoff Bogey alone. I will ride for Bogey. Important if he's healthy in guy. the playoffs, if he's healthy in the playoffs, I'm cool yeah. with that. But you're not going to pay some insane luxury tax bill for a seven seed every year. Well, hold like, on. Wrestler has shown that he is willing to pay. Hold on. He's an idiot. Hold on. Uh, let me check my notes here. He has paid the tax zero times. <laughs> oh, there so, you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a reason Kevin Herter is not on this basketball yeah, team. Like, he's not um, paying the tax. There's no way. Exactly. So, yeah. something has to give there. And I I do think eventually it leads to a trade trade. I just feel that. But, you know, it's not. It's also not crazy to think things really click this year and Quinn's a good coach. And, you know, the talent is there. And so... You know, if this is like a two seed next year, which I don't think is out of the realm of possibility. Like, I don't think that's some insane thing to think. The East is in flux. Um, then we're having a different conversation, but I don't think it is. Like, I think it's in the six through eight. And then you have to make really hard choices because you're not a contender and you're not a bottom feeder and you're in that middle where you got to figure something out. They lived there for a long time, and I don't think that there there's any interest in getting back there. It's one of the worst places to be in the NBA. Team that you can like where the Knicks are right now. No one actually thinks that the Knicks are going to go win a championship with this roster that they have. The Nets are like that. Then no one no one thinks they're going to go. Win well, a the Knicks are when they get Embiid, but that's beside the point. I wouldn't be surprised. I Philly also. I feel like Philly is is about to get just blown up. I just have a feeling. 
all of those expectations, all of that. And maybe, maybe they'll have a year with dark without doc rivers and see what they can do with was a vocal, right? No, Nick nurse. I think Nick they upgraded. Nurse. No, there's Nick nurse. Yeah. Well, I think he's a great coach. So uh, we'll see what happens with that. Vogel vocals. Like I just got hired it up at the sun. Phoenix. Um, no, but if, if they end up trading Trey young, it just means that Quinn Snyder didn't want Trey young on this team. That's really all it comes down to. The relationship failed. And cause he has final say, right? Isn't that the right now? Quinn? Yeah. yeah. I think Quinn Snyder was a pretty important part of the, the building the roster out with this is probably a major like, component. Dad, go fly. You had some <laughs> you'd major to, component. You'd have uh, to think they gave that. him serious concessions to mm-hmm. come in. They had to. They had and, to. And take this on. And it's like a kind of a below average job, if I'm being honest. Like it's not like you saw evidence of like all of these other nicer jobs that came open and Quinn's probably kicking himself a little bit right now. But you know. He's got some. He's got some pieces. I mean, the Hawks aren't in these dire straits where like they're not going to be a good basketball team next year. There's a good chance that they are a pretty solid team, uh, but it's just, there's not a, like Max. You talked about like there's just not a lot of flexibility. Like there's not what moves can you make right now with that you're going to get better with uh, as a result. You know, like maybe you find a diamond in the rough in the draft. I don't think you will necessarily at 16, but. But that's part of the thing. If you found a diamond in the rough, like where are the minutes for him? And that's that's the yeah. thing with this roster is like it's not a bad roster. It's almost it's it's log jammed like hmm. with guys who are 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 neutral assets at best, right? And so I think a trade trade would like sh- it's not happening. We've said it a million times would shake loose some of the like rigidity of the roster because. I think we all we all think AJ Griffin is going to be a really good player, right? Well, yeah. only one of us has been on that since the early part of the season. I mean, no, some people on this like, program is like, start look, immediately, and I was like, Jalen Johnson should be the starting he's four. Yeah. Uh, Jalen Johnson has a great future. Yeah, <laughs> but like AJ Griffin was getting DMPs at the end of last year. Mm. Um, yeah, and I don't think that was wrong. Like, I don't, I don't wasn't like dying for him to get playoff minutes. I don't think he was ready. But like that development takes minutes and it takes it has well, to be thankfully, a spot uh, minutes and availability is not deandre hunter's strong suit so aj <laughs> will get plenty of opportunity next year well but it's also like you look at a lot of the holes in this team like i just don't think that they're they just need more they need more shooting yeah like they need more shooting this is why i don't think john collins is back is i but think quinn's not gonna run it back with them. face it's just we've been saying it for so long i agree he's probably on the chopping block he i he should have been on the chopping block two years ago Mm-hmm. And we talked about it a lot and he just wasn't. And for whatever reason, he's just, I think he's just, is it the albatross of a contract? Is it the fact that they think that he can't produce at the high level anymore? Is it his finger? Is it, what is it? Like it, eventually he's going to get traded. They're going to have to sell him. For it's going to be for him, for Davis Bertans in Dallas. They're just going to get off the contract and it's going to be Davis oh, or Lord. Reggie Bullock or something. I think he ends I, up in Dallas. I think, for one of I think he, get, he yeah. ends up getting traded for a yeah, shooter. He ends up getting traded for a wing shooter, and yeah. I think that that makes room for some more DeAndre Hunter at the four, which I think I, lo- I love. I that. think a Quinn Snyder led team w- would like a lot. Um, yeah, and, and, Bay at the and three. Hunter and Sadiq and Jalen Johnson cover the, cover the four, and you get more flexibility with lineups because Collins can't. I mean, Collins couldn't play anything besides the four. Yeah, uh, with this team, and, and you get more flexible there, but it's going to be a sell low on Collins, right? Like you have guys to. value has. I think it's it's a di- almost addition by subtraction. Like like you said, it's it's literally just a log jam because he has to play. He needs the minutes, and he's too good not to give those minutes to him. And I think if you do trade him, it's it's you're expecting Jalen Johnson to take a major step forward and Sadiq Bay to be your everyday four. Um, which effective, which I'm fine with. Ultimately, I think at the end of the day, it's like Jalen Johnson said plenty of times to develop and get better. Um, and maybe maybe in some crazy world. If Anyeko Kongwu is this dude who we're seeing, I, we said this last year. I don't. I'm less of a believer this year. But it's like if you if you can develop a shot, what if he plays at, at the four? I figured out what Jalen Johnson is going to be. By the way, Aaron Gordon. That's fine. Jalen Johnson is Aaron, is going to be Aaron Gordon. Flashy athleticism. I think. I think. Lust watch. Defender. Watch Aaron Gordon in this finals. Like that is that is what Jalen Johnson's end product is. Which I is fine. Aaron Gordon's got like 50 pounds on him. Um, Aaron was, Gordon's gigantic. Yeah, but he also put on a lot of weight. Jim Johnson's like contest. 20 years old. 
Yeah, yeah, he put on a lot of weight. He was he was pretty. Aaron Gordon was pretty thin coming into the league. He wasn't as scrawny as he wasn't as scrawny as Jalen. Like Johnson, there is a size difference. I think this he was is bigger than Jalen. But this Jaylen is Max going me. full super fan here. I don't even no, know what on, to make of on. this. I'm gonna I'm gonna Jalen Johnson to Aaron Gordon Charlie. comp. I could see it. The boy I just don't know play. how he's gonna play when you are not allowed to play him because Dude, I said you so. are making things up. Aaron Gordon weighs 220 pounds. Jalen Johnson no, he... weighs 219 pounds. <laughs> Hold he on, that's, there's no I way that's right. Bigger. I think he's got the muscle mass. The muscle mass is like a little bit more pronounced, I think. Maybe it's I'm Aaron Gordon's be. upper half is bigger than Jalen John, uh, Jalen Johnson's entire body. Like he's, he's built he's like a tank. He doesn't have 40 up. pounds on him. I can tell you that. That man, I'm looking at a side by side right now. I don't know how that is side by side photo of the two of them. Huh? He's got two photos. I got no. I got oh. two. I have two different tabs right now. I'm <laughs> that, that would mean the that tabs. there's another comparison there. Yeah. <laughs> like somewhere else. Yeah, just, camera, camera angles, distortions, things of that nature. No. Aaron Gordon's built like freaking tractor trailer over here. I don't know what we're talking Jesus about. Johnson's twenty years old. Yeah, give him some that. time. I think I think he could be a depth One. four. He'll be fine. I'll be fine with that. I think it just starts. I think once the moves start coming, they're going to start hitting fast. Give me some shooters, mm. please, 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 please. All right, uh, we'll leave it there. Um, Garrett Chapman, W Millennials, I ain't trying the game. What can the good folks check out from you this week? Back in studio on Sunday. I got the day off tomorrow. How crazy is go. that? Yeah, it's what are you great. doing? Uh, taking a lady on a date, and then I got a buddy's birthday party. Surprise yeah. birthday party, so don't tell them. Don't tell them. All right, I'll, I'll wait to post until after. Wait to post. <laughs> wait to post. And then we're back in studio on, on Sunday. Uh, but lots of lots of recruiting stuff happening over the course of the weekend, so that'll keep me busy. There you Probably. go, Max. What do we what do we plug with you? What do, what do um, you want to do? You don't have to plug anything, but I, I I did go through Basketball Reference, and I can confirm that Aaron Gordon is two thirty five on Basketball Thank Reference. Thank you. So I said two forty. I'll concede a little bit, but the thought that Jalen Johnson can't put on fifteen pounds in the next seven years, no. All right, I feel better because I'm like, there's no way they're the same size. I've looked at this man. That is not a two hundred and twenty pound man. There is no. You don't, you don't. You don't need to plug anything. But when tell tell fans that when we're watching the NBA Finals, we watch Aaron Gordon and we see the future in Jalen Johnson. This is just, future baby. I, I can't stand for any of this. Sadiq Bay all the time. Garrett Chapman, Max Markovich. Thank you as always. Y'all have a great weekend, and I will talk to y'all next week. Well done, nephew. Chase Thomas podcast. Hell yeah. Oh, 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 oh,